Welcome back. We hope you all enjoyed your breakout sessions. Up next on today's agenda is one of my personal favorites, our special sneak peek session. During this session, our R&D team will be providing a look behind the curtain of some of our upcoming features. Now, this is the, only the second time Anshape has ever done this, and we're really excited to show you all what we've been working on. So, without further ado, let me introduce the man of the hour, Senior Vice President of R&D for Onshape, Paul Chastel. Thanks, Loretta. Hello, everyone. Here at Onshape, every three weeks, we add new abilities to Onshape and improve existing ones. We don't often talk about what we have planned, but I wanted to take this opportunity to share some improvements to Onshape that you ought to see over the coming year. To do this, I'll be joined by members of Onshape's R&D team and by members of our UX and support team. Our team isn't new to giving demos. Every week we all get together and look at what we're working on, and today you'll get a chance to see that too. The team will be walking you through projects that they are personally walking on, giving you an up-to-date view of where we are and where we're going. When we're done, we'll open up to any questions you may have for us. Let's begin with Onshape's modelling. Modelling's where it all starts, building designs in part studios and assemblies, and we're always looking for ways to improve design in Onshape. Pranav Tilak has been working on such improvements to Onshape's assembly design tools. Pranav, let's get it started. Thanks, Paul. Hello, everyone. My name is Pranav Tilak and I work in the assemblies team at Onshape. I am super excited to display what we have been working on for named positions and some of our recent improvements to the in-context notifications. Storing special assembly positions can become super useful, and we have kept our users' requirements in mind when developing this feature. Our users have some pretty hefty assemblies, and storing and loading multiple positions can become quite unwieldy. The assemblies could also change over time, and the named positions should sustain even after the tweaks and edits to the model by the collaborating CAD engineers. The new named positions provide a solution to these problems. There is a panel on the right side of our assembly view. Here, we can add, edit, view, and apply named positions. Let us explore it using this excavator model, which has multiple actuating rods and arms. To store the assembly's current position as a named position, Simply type in the name in the table. Let us drag the model to denote a change in the assembly's current position. To load the named position, right-click to open the context menu and select the Apply option. We are also introducing the concept of position mates. These are the mates the user can specify as being important for the named positions. For our excavator, let us select the bucket actuator to play that role. Click on the position mates button and select the mate from the assembly tree or the graphics and select the intended degrees of freedom. Alternatively, we can also right click on the mate in the assembly tree and select add to named position. Note that this action added a column in the table on the right side panel. We can modify the mate value and obtain even more flexibility from our named positions. If we wish our bucket to be open in this position, we can simply edit the mate value and obtain the desired result. For larger and more complex assemblies, adding all the important mates might become cumbersome. Plus, a lot of the mates might be grouped together and work with each other. In such cases, we can add subassembly named positions into our table. Let us see how using our model. For this, we will focus on the other two actuator rods, the boom and the arm. First, we add the desired named positions in our subassembly. Let us add two named positions. I have already done the same for the boom subassembly. Next, we insert the subassembly into our named position table. Now, we can select the subassembly named position from the dropdown. And that's it. Let us see how our excavator model looks like with an extended boom, a retracted arm, and an open bucket. 
we encourage our users to build their top-level named positions from the ground up using subassemblies. It really makes the feature easier to work with, faster, and more robust. Speaking of flexibility and impact, we plan to incorporate named positions in other major areas of the software. You can insert them seamlessly into drawings, just like exploded views. You can also expect them to be seen in the simulations feature, which is in the pipeline. Named positions can be used in tandem with other features. One such place is the in-context feature, which, by the way, itself has a few improvements. Let us have a look. Here we have a clamp model with a simple cover. As we can see, the clamp has an upright position and a lowered position in which the cover is modeled with in-context. The user can reference off the in-context assembly when making features and update the context whenever they see fit. Note that the top of the cover will change when I update my context. However, a problem may arise if the context changes without the user's knowledge. For example, if the handle gets larger, the context would no longer be correct. Onship is introducing notifications in Path Studio and assemblies to signal a change in the reference geometry of any associated feature. The blue notification indicates that a context may be out of date and the blue dot marks which context it is. From there, the users can simply update the context as before. A similar notification is displayed in the assembly with the ability to update from the right-click context menu. Additionally, we have also added indicators in Part Studio for features that belong to the specific active context. This will give users a better idea of which features may be affected by the update. The modeling team is truly pumped up to be able to reveal these improvements and is working hard and fast for you to get your hands on them. Until then, we would love to hear your comments and feedback. Thank you. Back to you, Paul. Thanks, Pranav. I'm sure if you're designing assemblies today, you'll be happy to see what Pranav and the team are working on right now. One of Onshape's many advantages, being cloud native, is the ease with which an engineer can extend the design team by sharing designs with people in many different roles while maintaining complete control over those designs. Nat Mishkin has been working on new ways to package and share Onshape designs. Nat, show them what you've got. My name is Nat Mishkin, a technical fellow at PTC. I'm a software developer and I've been working on Onshape for the past six years. Today I'm going to talk about collaboration in Onshape, and in particular, the collaboration feature we call sharing. Document sharing is a great feature, but it has some limitations. Imagine I'm a product designer, and I've created this document that contains a number of parts and assemblies. I need to work with one of my contract manufacturers to review the manufacturability of the fan. And I want to share the power jack with the supplier to get a quote. I don't want either of them to see the whole design. I can't use the share dialog to do this because that shares the whole document. Documents are what we call the unit of sharing today. I could split the document up into multiple documents, but that's a tedious process. And I might not want to do that because documents are also the unit of design. They're containers for parts, assemblies, and drawings that you want to design closely together. By the way, documents are also units of versioning. You create versions of an entire document and anyone who can see the document can necessarily see all the versions of the document. What we're seeing here is that these different aspects of documents, that their units of sharing, design, and versioning are in conflict. To deal with these conflicts, we're introducing a new kind of container that we call a publication. A publication is a collection of specific versions or revisions of parts, assemblies, and drawings that are in one or more on-chip documents. Some people call this type of collection a technical data package. You create a publication and insert specific versions or revisions of parts, assemblies, and drawings into it. Here, I create a fan publication and first insert the fan assembly for my main design document. And finally, I insert the fan drawing from a document that contains my drawings. Like on-shape documents, publications can be shared with other on-shape users. For example, here I want to get some feedback from my contract manufacturer on that fan part. When the manufacturer opens the publication, they get something very similar to what you get when you open a view-only Onshape document. But unlike a document, they can only see the specific version of the part that was added to the publication. The supplier can make comments for the product designer to see. 
Notice how the supplier can't edit anything in the publication or switch to other versions, revisions, or workspaces. We've also created another publication with just the power jack for the supplier to give us a quote on. And the supplier can open the second publication on their tablet and see the plug's 3D design and its associated drawing. The design and implementation of publications are in their very early stages, and a lot more work remains to be done. But I hope I've piqued your interest. We'd love to hear feedback on what you've seen in this presentation and the use cases you have that publications might be able to support. Thanks. Thanks, Nat. We've received plenty of input from customers that sharing live data is awesome, but that they want more control over what data is shared and how it is packaged without giving up control. I expect that what Nat and the team are working on will be well used. As Nat said, it's not quite as ready as what Pranav was showing. Expect to see it later this year. You'll have seen drawings in Nat's demo, and they are still a critical means of communication for engineers, and one which we are constantly striving to improve in Onshape. This year, we will be joined not only by members of my R&D team, but also by our UX and support team. Matt Lowe is someone that may well have handled the tickets of many of you watching today, and he is going to take us through some imminent improvements to drawings in Onshape. Matt, take it away. Hi, my name is Matt, and I am a product definition engineer here at Onshape, which means I do both UX and technical support. Today, I will be showing you a cool new drawing feature that many of you may find useful. When passing drawings to a manufacturer, engineers may want to highlight critical annotations. This would ensure that the manufacturer gets those specifications as accurately as possible. Soon, we will be able to control individual entity settings using the style panel. This panel will be located above the Drawing Properties panel option on the right. To use the style panel, we must select a dimension we want to change. The style panel will then populate with that dimension settings. We can customize the dimension to however we like it, and changes will apply only to that one dimension. In this case, I am changing the font, the font size, the color, and the arrow style. We can also select multiple dimensions of different designs and add a custom style to that group selection. With the new style panel, we can highlight specific dimensions, such as critical dimensions. We can also show that certain annotations have come from a different user. If we want to revert annotations back to the default style, we can do so by clicking the revert button at the bottom of the style panel. In this first release, the style panel will work with dimensions. In the future, we plan on incorporating style controls for all drawing entities. We hope this gives you more control of your drawings. We can't wait for you to give this new functionality a try. Thank you. That's excellent, Matt. This should really help you to produce the final documentation for your designs. And as Matt says, there's more to come. Speaking of which, let's go back to designing. One of the many innovations introduced by PTC decades ago was parametric design. Onshape may be built differently, but customers still benefit from designs that update effortlessly as design requirements change. To take us through some improvements that we are making to control parameters or variables in Onshape, I'm going to hand it over to Anton, engineering the feature script team. Anton, do it. Thanks, Paul. Hi, I'm Anton Bogan, an engineer on the feature script team. Onshape has seen several recent improvements that make it easier to create and edit variables within a part studio. We support variable rename propagation. Variables can be defined on the fly. And the variable table lets you interactively view and edit your variables. We encourage using variables because they let you update related parts of your design with a single change. Because the design can span multiple tabs, including part studios and assemblies, we'd like the variables driving it to be available in the same scope. For example, suppose we want to attach these two parts with a variable number of bolts. We'd like a single variable to control the number of holes in both parts, 
as well as the number of bolts on the assembly. Right now, the number of bolts on the assembly is hard-coded. The two parts are defined by local variables repeated in both part studios, as you can see in their variable tables. To remove the repetition by putting the design intent in one place, we can use a new tab called the Variable Studio. Anyone who's used the Part Studio variable table will find this familiar. As you can see, I'm replicating the variables that define the two parts in this tab. Going to one of our Part Studios, we can see that the Variable Studio has appeared in its variable table alongside the pre-existing feature variables. This means that the variables in it are available for use in any feature, just like the Part Studio's own. We can think of these as available at the start of regeneration. We can now suppress the feature variables, letting the shared variables drive our part instead. Observe that our features continue to regenerate correctly. We can do the same in the other part studio. We can edit the variable studio directly from here. Let's increase the whole count from 3 to 5. Note that the update has caused our part to regenerate in response. Because the other part is also driven by the same variable, its whole count has also changed. Assemblies can also use these shared variables, for example, to drive parts configurations, mate limits, and instance counts. Here, I'm changing the hard-coded instance count to use a shared variable. Note that the assembly now also has a variable table panel, and that the variable studio likewise appears here. We can identically update the shared variables from here. Let's increase the whole count to 8. Of course, this not only affects the assembly, but every tab driven by the shared variables. We see that the number of bolts changes, as does the whole count in our part studios. We can insert variable studios into part studios, assemblies, and other variable studios. If a variable studio is needed in multiple tabs, we can set it to be automatically inserted in this workspace. This means that every new and existing part studio and assembly will have access to its variables. Otherwise, we can import a variable studio into only the tabs where it's needed. Let's say we have a document containing variable studios with standard bearing dimensions, and we need this part to accept a standard bearing, shown in green. Right now, the dimensions of the bearing are defined by local variables. Let's suppress these and look in our shared document for the standard dimensions. Note that we can insert the full complement of variables or just the subset we need. Now, just like before, the shared variables are driving our part. Just now, we imported variables into only one part studio. We can also imagine doing the same in an automatically inserted variable studio which then makes those variables available to every part studio and assembly in the workspace. In this way, we can mimic a variable set that's global to one or more documents. With this improvement, we hope you'll find it a bit easier to build robust parametric designs with minimal repetition. We look forward to your feedback, and we hope to get this out to you soon. Back to you, Paul. That's some really nice work, Anton. If this all looks ready to use, that's because it almost is. And we know that lots of people have been eagerly awaiting the power of global variables. Being cloud native allows Onshape to be delivered to all sorts of different devices, wherever you may be, and to benefit from the unique capabilities those devices bring. Andrew Holmes, UX and support engineer, has been spending much time working with R&D to make the most of what mobile devices can bring to engineering. Andrew, over to you. Hey everyone, I'm Andrew from the user experience team. Onshape has always been easily accessible from any device, including on our dedicated mobile app. Right now, I'm using an iPad Pro along with a keyboard and an Apple Pencil that I've been using to work on my latest design. Let's take a look at several enhancements we've made throughout the design process on iPad. Beginning on the Documents page, we've made better use of the screen real estate by including a split view with the info panel. So I can drag this around with my finger to resize it, and at this point, I'm going to hop into the bottle document to make some final edits in the part studio. The last thing I need to design here is the cap for the bottle. So I can start to navigate around the model using my finger, or I can use the trackpad. We're also bringing full keyboard shortcut support to mobile. So, for example, 
I can use Shift-5 to get a top-down view, or Shift-6 to snap to an isometric view. And finally, I'll take a look at a section view with Shift-X. To finish up this part, I need to add a couple more features. I'm going to continue working on this sketch that I started with the Apple Pencil, so that I have a little bit more precision. We're adding the ability to long press with the pencil to access the context menu, so I'll do that now to quickly view normal to the sketch. At this point, I have a couple more sketch entities to add, and so I'll use the keyboard to quickly pull up each sketch tool while I use the pencil to place the sketch entities. Next, I'll press the D key to activate the dimension tool, and I'll use the keyboard here to select each entity and type in a value. Now I'm going to create a revolve feature from the sketch, and so I'll define the revolve axis, and I'll make sure it creates a new part. The last feature that I want to add at this point is an extrude off of this face. I'll create that up to the face of the new part that we just added, and I'm going to make sure that I add that to the merge scope. So at this point, I should be done with the part. And now I'm going to switch to the assembly so that we can insert it. I'll quickly just insert the part and add it to the group that I created from before. We'll soon be adding the bomb panel on mobile, so I can open that with a split view and see that the part that I created has been added to the bill of materials automatically. So at this point, I'd like to quickly get a sense of how my design fits in with the world around me and share that with my client. I have a couple other bottles here in front of me, along with a container, and I'd like to roughly see how the size of our new design will fit in. Using my iPad, I can quickly reverse engineer whatever is in front of me using the new LiDAR scanning mode. As I begin a new scan, Onshape detects whatever is in front of me and creates a scan. This can be great for estimating the size of real world objects or even entire room layouts. I'm just going to walk around now and get a wide scan of the whole table, and once that's done, I'll upload the file directly into my document. So you can see at this point that the scan is brought into its own part studio. And I'm going to insert this into the bottle assembly, just so we can put them side by side. I'll move the bottle into position, and now I've quickly been able to capture what this bottle will look like relative to the other objects in front of me. You may also be interested in cleaning up the mesh by directly editing it, but more on that later. To wrap up, there's one other way that we could quickly get a sense of how our bottle design lines up with the real world. Instead of scanning my surroundings, I'll do the reverse process and project an AR view of the model onto the world around me. So now, this means I can share the model directly with my client through Onshape, and they'll be able to get a dimensionally accurate AR view of the completed design that they can view from anywhere. Thanks, Andrew. Mobile isn't just another way to do the same tasks. It provides opportunities that a desktop or laptop just can't. You can be sure that you'll see Onshape continue to embrace mobile computing. Part of what Andrew showed is how Onshape can scan data and directly import it into documents. There are many ways to get scanned data today and many reasons why engineers would want to be able to work with that data, but that's easier said than done. Or is it? Ben is going to bring us home with some really exciting additions to Onshape's part design capabilities. Ben, no pressure. Thanks, Paul. Hi, I'm Ben Vergy. I'm a software development engineer here at Onshape and I work with the modeling team. Today, I will be presenting a new functionality, Mix Modeling. Our users can already get mesh elements into Onshape by importing STL or BGR GLGF files, and they can use those meshes to inform the designs. But their options are a little limited because meshes are different from parts and surfaces. Well, with Mix Modeling, this distinction is now lifted, and Mesh simply designates a new face type. Here I am creating a mold for this mesh grip. I have subtracted the mesh part from this box, and split the box in half, keeping only the bottom part. It now has both mesh and non-mesh faces, and the parts list icon highlights that it contains mesh elements. This will be the cavity of our core cavity mold, so let's create the core. 
I'm going to extrude this rectangle up to this part. And here the extrusion in principle of the analytical and the mesh faces. Since this is a mold, we want to add some spacing. And to do that, I'm going to use our move face feature to offset this mesh face a little inward. I'm also going to use our move face feature again, this time to translate the mesh face. Now, we have many functionalities and features that work with mixed modeling, and I'm not going to enumerate them all. Instead, I'm going to move on to a more fleshed out version of this mold. Here for the core, I have added some holes by using our holes feature and by simply extruding some circles. And we can see that the extruded circles cut nicely through the mesh face. For the cavity, I have applied a shell feature and remove the bottom face. And we can see that inside we have the outline of the mesh face on the outside. I've also added some ribs for structural integrity. Now I am satisfied with this mold, so I'm going to move on to an assembly where I can now add our mixed parts. We can also add mesh parts if we want to. And those mixed and mesh parts will behave just like analytical ones. For example, I can add a mate between this cavity and this mounting plate, and I can use our replicate tool to create additional copies of it. Now, let's say you want to create a drawing of, for example, this core part. Well, you can do that too. Here I'm creating a four view drawing, and it will be no different than a drawing with only analytical parts. I can add more views. I can add a section view. I can add dimensions. It behaves just like a regular drawing. Finally, if you want to take this mixed part outside of Onshape, well, you can export it to STL or other mesh formats where it will be converted to a full mesh, or you can export it to Parasolid format where it will remain mixed. And that's all I have for you today. I would like to thank Jake Rosenfeld, Lana Saxenoff, Kevin O'Toole, Lou Gallo, and Jake Ransley for their involvement in this project. We have a lot of new functionalities coming up with mixed modeling, and we cannot wait for our users to experiment with them when it ships, which should be very soon. Thank you, and back to you, Paul. That's great, Ben. If you like what you're seeing there, you won't have to wait too long before you'll start using what Ben showed. Okay, everyone, that is it. We're done. I'd like to extend many thanks to all my colleagues that have presented today. And as Ben mentioned, there are many more people that aren't here today that have been working on getting these new features in the hands of you all. I'd like to thank all of them too. I hope you've appreciated the opportunity to hear directly from the people that make Onshape. And now we'd like to open it up to answer any questions you may have. Enter any questions for us just as you have throughout the day. Team, excellent. I can see you're there. And the first question I have, Nat, is for you. Can I make a publication of a release package? Right. Well, it's uh, early in our design, but that's definitely something that we're considering adding. Uh, it would be something that we'd expect to be a checkbox or a button that you could press during the process of uh, creating a release package. And it would create the publication and then separately you could uh, go and share that to whoever you want to be able to see the newly released parts. Okay, thanks, Nat. Um, next, Pranav, will users be able to select a named position in the assembly context? Uh, yeah, so name positions as a feature is very flexible, and we do plan to exploit that property in different areas of the software. Uh, currently, we are focused on integrating it in two major areas, drawings and simulations. Uh, we may support using named positions directly as an assembly context in the future, but for now, it remains a two-step process. Um, although keeping track of the assembly context and updating it and managing it can become immensely easier now with named positions, um, as you saw in the demo. Excellent. Thank you. A question for you, Matt. Will the style changes be carried into DXF files? For, example, uh, for instance, being able to change the color lines to enable laser cutting or engraving? Yeah, so uh, the style panel will um, carry, the changes will carry over into DXF files. Uh, so when this works with uh, all drawing entities, it can be used uh, for laser engraving or laser cutting. Great, thank you. Um, Anton, what are some other use cases that you envisage Variable Studios helping to improve or enhance? 
Uh, yeah, so variable studios are going to be useful whenever you need uh, variables available outside a single part studio. Uh, you, might have no you might have noticed that we're not introducing assembly variables as such, uh, but variable studios now allow you to have, to have shared variables and assemblies. Uh, for instance, uh, I had a linear rail model lying around. It's a linear rail with a carriage moving along it. You might want to set an assembly mate, uh, to set a limit on the slider mate uh, to end at the end of the carriage, uh, at, at, the end of the light, at the end of the rail, so that the carriage doesn't come off. And that's what variable studios let you do. Uh, additionally, uh, frequently designers will make uh, a great number of parts in a single part studio. But if you have variables outside that part studio that are shared, uh, you can split up your parts and design them in uh, several part studios uh, without having to uh, lump them all together. Excellent. Yes, plenty of uh, plenty of ideas there. Thank you, um, Andrew. Can you directly edit BOM and configuration tables on mobile? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, to start, it will just be a kind of view only panel, but. Our goal is to get it up to parity with what we have on the web and have export and edit actions in there as well. Excellent. Um, and Nat, another question for you. Can publications be shared with the link sharing functionality? Well, again, I'll you know fall back to the uh, uh, my statement that we're still early in the design, but we think that's uh, certainly both desirable and technically feasible. And uh, being that people are expressing interest in it, that uh, would probably bump it up on our priority of things to include, if not in the first release, then you know uh, soon after. Okay, and I'll stick with you for another question. Uh, what happens if a publication refers to a revision of a part that's been superseded? Well, that's a really interesting question, and we've talked about that. And I think that um, something you didn't see in the demo, and it's not there yet, but we have this idea that when you insert um, a revision of a part, that you can have a choice to say, I'm inserting this particular revision of the part, you know, part uh, revision A or B, uh, or I could also revision saying, uh, I could insert it into the publication in a way that says, I'm logically inserting the latest revision of the part, and I want it to be the case that whenever anybody opens the publication, they see the latest revision. So that would be an option, because we think that there's some people who will want one behavior. It's like, hey, I'm publishing revision C of this part, not, nothing else. It, it's always going to be C, no matter who opens it, for all time, they'll get revision C. And sometimes they might want to say, what I'm really intending here is that I want this publication to contain the latest revision of the part. So we think that's a, a really good feature and, and one we're looking at including. Excellent. Um, Andrew, will there be a way to download the bill of materials uh, on iOS or get it out of Onshape onto the iPad in some way? Yeah, so it's going to be just view only for now, but that's something we're hoping to get to, and we'll get there. Okay, excellent. And, and uh, I'll stick with you for another question, which is about textured yeah, sure. models from Render Studios. Um, will you be able to view models from Render Studio in the augmented reality uh, part of the app? That's a that's a great question. I hope we get there. We're uh, we're not quite there. It's just going to be kind of the direct CAD model with your face appearances and your part appearances for now. Um, but love to get okay. there. Excellent. Um, Matt, or maybe Andrew, or both of you. But Matt, you can go first. Um, is there going to be any editing of drawings on mobile? Not yet, but that is something uh, that we've been wanting to do, um, and we are working on it. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Anton, can you have multiple variable studios in one document? Uh, yeah. Uh, these things are very similar to part studios and assemblies. Uh, you can have multiple of them in the same document. Uh, you can have them in different documents. You can reference them. Uh, you can reference as many of them uh, anywhere you like, i.e. Uh, in variables, studios, parts, studios, and assemblies. Uh, and uh, you can version manage them as you would anything else. Uh, we're hoping that the robustness of this design is going to uh, is going to let you make these variables as global as you need them to be. Excellent. 
Excellent. Andrew, so back to you. You showed the pen being used on iPads. Are we expecting to support pens and keyboards on Android? Mm -hmm. uh, nothing to announce right now, but you know we're trying to take advantage of what the iPad has for, for the moment. Thank you. Um, ben, a question to you on the mixed modeling. What happens when I want to export a mixed model? What about a mesh model? Uh, well, that will depend on the format that you choose. If you want to export to a parasolid format, you'll be able to keep both your mixed models, your mesh, as well as your uh, analytical models as before. Uh, if you export to a mesh-compatible CAD format like STEP242, uh, your mixed models will be converted to mesh, and your meshes will stay meshes uh, in the export files. Um, if you want to export to a native uh, mesh format like STL, everything will be converted to mesh as it is currently. And finally, if you're exporting to a CAD format that does not support meshes, then both mixed models and meshes will simply be skipped. Okay. Thank you. For now, um, okay, this is a long one. I'll read this out. Um, will the coming improvements to in-context modeling include linking the display state that it was created with to the in-context definition, so to avoid having to manually reset the view before updating a context? Oh, uh, that's a quite great question. Um, if I understand that correctly, that's definitely something that uh, we are thinking of planning further in context improvements. Um, it's not in our immediate plan, but uh, it's definitely something that we are going to be looking out for in the future. Okay, thank you. How does the, Matt, how does the style panel differ from the properties panel? So the drawing properties panel changes the style of all existing um, and all future drawing entities. Uh, meanwhile, the style panel will only change uh, the selected entities. Okay, thank you. And back to you, Pranav. Will we support designing a sub-assembly using a top-level assembly context? Uh, yeah, we have definitely thought about it. I know um, some other users have also requested that feature and have expressed interest. Uh, we don't do that right now, but uh, we do have some ideas and thoughts about how to implement that in the future. Excellent. Um, Anton, can the variable studio be shared to other documents? So it, does, it automatically exists only in one document. Uh, however, as, uh, as you saw in the demo, you can freely insert them from other documents uh, the, in the same way that you can only insert, insert parts uh, with the derived feature or uh, assemblies uh, from a version. You can also only link these things from another document from a version. That makes them immutable. Right, right. So rather than pushing from one document to another, we're we're pulling it out of, a, of another document, just like the other functionalities in, in Onshape today. Yeah. Excellent. Um, oh, there's a question here that I'm going to answer. At Onshape Live 21, we saw a preview of an FEA package built into Onshape. Is there any progress on this? And, and yes, there is. We have, uh, we're making progress, in fact, with early visibility with our simulation. And uh, our simulation is going to be, um, be available pretty soon, we think. And in fact, if you go and look at some of the the other talks here today in Onshape Live, you'll see that we've discussed the simulation. Thanks for that. Uh, Nat, question for you. Any plans on adding direct dimensioning, tolerance, and other MBD type data elements to finished models? Seems like it would work well with publications. Well, I, uh, I think there's no immediate plans to do that. Um, I think I get the point so we can take that back to the team and we can uh, discuss it. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Nat. Sorry, just, uh, just getting the feed here. Andrew, are there any improvements in comments on mobile devices like freehand sketches? Uh, so I think that's two questions maybe. So comments. Um, I'd love some feedback on what improvements people are interested in in comments on mobile. 
um, on freehand sketching, uh, yeah, a, a big goal of ours is to make better use of the, the Apple Pencil in general. Um, so I'm hoping we can see some improvements there in the future as well. I guess maybe what, what, what the question is getting out there is maybe redlining, being able to circle things to put into the comment, like today you have to use the, the drawing tools. But, uh, I would mark up and right. but, yeah. Um Okay, um, and I'll stick with you for another question, which is about the LiDAR. What, what are some of the applica other applications of LiDAR scanning and AR? Yeah, I think, so with LiDAR, the thing I'm kind of most excited about that we didn't get to show is, you know, being able to scan an entire room relatively quickly and, you know, for maybe something like a factory floor, getting to do some rapid testing there. Um, with AR, on a, on a lighter note, I think what I'm kind of excited for is to just kind of be designing and, you know, maybe I'm designing on my computer, but I have my phone next to me and I can, you know, quickly pull the model that I'm designing and see it right away. So I'm looking forward to that. Okay. Thank you. Ben, is it possible to leverage AI to convert invo <coughs> imported meshes from STL to on-shape features? Well, that would be extremely cool, but unfortunately, no, that's not in the plans for now. You're right, it would be very cool. Okay, well, that's about all the time we have today. Team, thanks for being here and answering questions from our OnShape community. Thanks, thanks Paul. Thank you. thank you. And thanks to all of you, uh, to all of you, for submitting your questions and being a part of this engaging conversation. If we didn't get to answering your questions today, we'll follow up. It's always great to hear what is on your mind, and it really helps us on our quest to improve OnShape for our entire community of OnShape.